The MMOs whose lifespans can be measured in decades have become these towering mountains of game, so large that you could probably chisel off a small percentage of their stony edifice and still be left with a satisfactory video game. Dungeons of Sundaria is among the latest indie efforts to do just that. Think World of Warcraft without the world, and you're on the right track. Your standard colored loot and leveling incentives are folded into repeatable MMO-style dungeons accessed via menu, playable solo or co-op via peer-to-peer -peer online, local split-screen, or remote play split-screen via Steam. Its reach does exceed its grasp, its low production values result in floaty animations and combat that lacks punch, but for all of its faults, its loot and levels are a compelling carrot on a stick, and its class variety gives you plenty of reason to experience the same dungeons in new ways. The result is a clunky but ultimately gratifying facsimile of the MMO dungeon experience. The hunt is on. I've got you in my sights. The first thing you do in Dungeons of Sundaria is select your race and class combination. The five available classes are your standard RPG fare, with rogues, warriors, mages, etc. The one key deviation from what you'd expect those archetypes to be capable of is ready access to powerful self-healing across all archetypes, allowing for solo dungeon clearing if you don't have any buddies. That's important because dungeons are literally the name of the game. Once your class is made, you're greeted with a simple menu-driven town interface, where NPCs at inns and smithies substitute the functions of player economies and professions from the MMOs Sundaria is aping. The only thing you do outside of the dungeons is this little pre-dungeon prep work, like stocking up on consumables and buffs you'll be using inside. Within minutes, you'll have a quest that pushes you towards the first of Sundaria's eight dungeons, most of which can easily run you about an hour to get through their bosses, and all of which have multiple difficulty scalings to allow for functionally endless dungeoning. Realistically, you're looking at about 12 to 15 hours of play, with an optional endgame of doing those same hours again against higher numbered enemies with hopefully the higher numbered gear you need to face them. The dungeons are static, the bosses are the same every time, and there's no modifiers or anything, but it's a decision that also amplifies the significance of the gear and your memorization of boss patterns. It's more compelling than it sounds. The laser focus on erecting you a metaphorical staircase and forcing you to climb it also means that each of those steps feels meaningful. Go through a dungeon, acquire all the gear inside, sell what you don't need back in town, and use the funds to buy some new ranks for your spells. Repeat as much or as little as you want. It's a timeless pattern, made obvious by how little Sundaria tries to append to it. Getting stuck on a dungeon only to crush it on a revisit thanks to your new epic weapon is the kind of sensation Sundaria excels at, and it manages to carry the game's less glamorous aspects. The inclusion of FPS-style hit markers isn't fooling anyone. They're basically the only feedback you get that these ugly models on screen are hitting each other, a flaw exacerbated by Sundaria inching closer towards action than the MMOs it's homaging. Tab targeting and auto attacks are replaced with directional action combat, where each swing is a discrete mouse click that feels a little flaccid with the weightless animations. The absence of scrolling combat text is a big miss, both because of how easily it fits into the game's numbers go up power fantasy, but also because it could have alleviated the oomphlessness of combat. The omission of a map screen is also a tough pill to swallow on your first round through each dungeon. A respectable decision to retain Sundaria's old-school exploration feel as it may be, it's a choice that falls flat in the face of reused assets and samey level designs, especially in the indoor environments. There are entire dungeon wings and floors that are indiscernible from each other. The Grasslands dungeon was a favorite of mine because it has an obvious visual landmark in the center of the map, a giant magical dome that gives you a sense of place and a destination to strive for. There's also these diegetic lasers that make it apparent which wings of the dungeons you get to clear. It's a shame that sort of in-universe pathing is the exception in Sundaria's dungeon suite, but where its dungeon layouts themselves don't always feel authored, the boss encounters within them do. Each dungeon boasts about a dozen bosses, and each boss is typically a grueling multi-phase encounter that challenges your character preparedness as much as your pattern recognition. They suffer from the same feedback issues that conventional mobs do, and the low production value rob them of some of the epic feel they were clearly going for, but what they lack in spectacle they compensate for mechanically, offering a variety of unique fight designs that demand your attention on the harder difficulties. <laughs> Dungeons of Sundaria may be a game of modest looks and obvious inspirations, but within its narrow scope it creates predictable leveling and dungeoning thrills. The colored loot-driven power fantasy at its core is nothing you haven't played before in more well-produced games. While Sundaria might be a fantasy looter at its most basic, 
it's also a fantasy looter at its most distilled. It doesn't even try to mask that it's just an incentive treadmill, and that honesty allows for it to be undistracted by anything other than the encounters and the purple fonted gear that make those encounters easier. It's not an essential addition to the loot lust pantheon of games, but there's plenty of enjoyment to be found in its simple dungeoning and the flexible multiplayer options that dungeoning allows.